Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. I am your host, Adam Portress, and I'm joined by Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear, and some men were meant to charge into battle, and some creme brulees are just a little too burnt on top. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what that means, but uh, I'll, I'll take it as... I'll take it as a good was my closest stab at something that would come out of the tick's mouth. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. That's good. I'm like, is this from a th- is this from a thing? Did I miss that part of the episode? No. Apparently, I didn't. <laughs> Bruce is just waxing poetic tick style here, and that's what we'll be doing today, everybody. When we're reviewing the tick from Amazon, uh, six episodes. We reviewed the pilot when it first came out. And now we're going to give you the first half of it and say, hey, man, should this be something that you spend your time on? I think we were pretty uh, fairly positive for the first episode. Yeah, I I seem to remember us being a little ambivalent, like we didn't hate it, but we didn't love it. Yeah, it was like, it's okay. I mean, like it's one of those because it wasn't it wasn't the Amazon pilot that they go and uh, they shoot and then people vote on it. And apparently they greenlit all the ones that they shot this year, I guess. Uh, So I don't know how that works. (laughs) Take some of the fun out of winning, doesn't it? Yeah, they're like, hey, everybody go and vote. Doesn't really matter because we're giving it to everybody. Like what kind of what kind of like, you know. 21st century t-ball is this everybody wins <laughs> <laughs> well uh they also took advantage of some of the feedback they got from that pilot you know they changed the costume around a little bit i think they changed the tone of the show just a little bit i think, I, I think it right. worked out for them rather than if they'd just produced a whole season at the same time they produced that pilot you know see, sometimes it's smart and you know and and we'll see if that uh that feedback was was worth it and what they did and, and may not have changed and stuff like that but uh I, i'm kind of excited to talk about this yes uh for those of you that are keeping score at home sean is out again uh he does send his regrets along not you know he's he's, he's not uh he, he's not dead Honestly, definitely not. Definitely not dead. Honest definitely not dead. <laughs> don't go. Don't go check in our closets. Don't look in the trunk of my car. No, There's don't do it. Definitely not Sean in there. There's nothing to find. There's. Uh, <laughs> 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 but uh, he, he'll be back. He'll be back. So, he'll be back back soon. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he may have a little. He may. He's not going to be here for next week. But I think he's he's already uh, cooked us up a little cameo for next week. So don't worry. Even though he's not here, he will be here in spirit and in voice, and you'll actually get to hear his thoughts on some stuff. But we'll cover that at the end of the show come next episode as well. Uh, what we do like to do at the top of the show here is, uh, you know, shout out to all the people that go over to patreon.com slash HMP and throw a little love our way, my man. Uh, we have a new one in here this week at the $5 level. Ken, Ken, welcome to the fold, my friend. Uh, you know, for people that are like Ken, he actually, oh, and I'm going to say this one. I don't know if I said this one the last time that it happened. I started up, but I had forgotten to unstar it. So maybe I didn't, uh, Amber, Amber, Amber also came in, came in and I can't remember if I mentioned Tim as well. Tim is in actually at the $10 level. Uh, so Tim also, that includes that you can have a shout out, whatever you want, man. So, uh, just, uh, drop us an email and we'll do that. But, uh, with, uh, Amber, and, uh, and and Ken, what they actually get, anyone at the $5 level gets the pre-show, the post-show. Of course, everyone at every level gets to vote on one of the movies that we watch uh, each and every month. And uh, other kinds of fun stuff. Maybe a bonus episode here or there. That's all you always got to check out in that thing. So if you want to help out with that, help defer the cost of the show and things of that measure, please go down to patreon.com slash HMP. We really appreciate everybody that does that, man. Uh, but what we want to do before we get into a review here, we do have to open up the old HMP mailbag. And I... Let's... Hold on. Wow, that, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys don't know is I accidentally stopped the recording at the same time, too. So this, I'm going to say take two, but it's actually take three. <laughs> <laughs> so terrible. Uh oh, gee whiz. <laughs> Bale's here. <laughs> Nothing but professionalism from us. I tried to tease it. Uh, <laughs> it didn't work. It didn't work at all. Let's just roll with it. Oh gosh. This one comes to us from Micah. Hey, is that Rocket Face Micah? Uh, yes, Mr. Rocket Face himself, uh supporter at patreon.com slash HMP. And he says, sorry about the long email. Now, he wrote this a couple days ago. And remember when I said, I can't, did I, did we have an email? I couldn't remember. We did have one. He wrote one. <laughs> I just forgot to put a little star by it so I could re- remember to read it. 
Uh, okay, Adam, the jig is up. It's time you let the faithful listeners know the truth about the real reason that Sean has not been showing up <laughs> to do the show. <laughs> Uh-oh. There's a rift growing between him and Bruce, and the source of th- of it is man's best friend, our faithful com- uh, canine companions. Sean has let the world know his deep levels of respect and admiration that he has for our furry four-legged friends on his given up... <laughs> On his Giving Up Too Soon podcast, Donkey <laughs> Pod. The illustrious five episodes in, and he had to hang it up. On the other side of the argument, we have Bruce, who's let his disdain for our own innocent puppy more, more than known, and has been projecting his reprobate fantasies onto the innocent pooches that we see on screen. <laughs> Speaking as someone who is a big supporter of all animals, I believe that Bruce should pay a penance <laughs> in order to make amends and to entice Sean to return. Perhaps a Patreon vote. Join the HMP Patreon to vote on Bruce's punishment. Also, watch Zorro the Gay Blade Rocket Face Blast Off. That's for, that's for a good buddy. I'm all for watching Zorro the Gay Blade, man. I watched that movie as a kid and loved it. So, um,. We got a we got a a Bruce punishment. Uh, th- that's all right. Well, I'm coming up with something. Don't worry. We'll we'll figure something out. Uh, but thanks. You for should the- uh, you should ban me from the show for four weeks. <laughs> Nobody listen, and then Sean can't come. Nobody wants an Adam only HMP. First, you of- have to learn a ventriloquist act or something to keep it going. <laughs> I think he's uh, he's pretty good. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I think that Adam guy's a real smart fella. That's when you know the show's a whole bunch of made up crap. Is then when all of them really start kind of patting me on the back, going, "He's handsome and smart." Uh. Hey, I'm I'm starting to get the feel that these guys ain't for real. <laughs> seems, seems... What was the name of the the famous ventriloquist dummy with the monocle? That's the one you need. <laughs> um. Oh. uh... <laughs> I don't From like remember. the old, old black and white days. What was what was the one? He's not as famous as Howdy Doody, but more uh, more debonair. What was the one that cursed at all the kids? You remember that? The Simpsons did a takeoff on it, but that was based on a real thing. Where... <laughs> I'm not familiar with it. Well, there was a guy who was on a television program, right, for kids and stuff. And, uh, and, oh, and yeah? they go to break and everything. And, uh, you know, the Simpsons did it. They just, it, but, uh, this happened for real where they went, they thought, okay, we're in break. And the guy and, and the guy and the ventriloquist just goes, well, that'll hold a little SOBs. And that was it. <laughs> that was kind of the end <laughs> of his career. Cause they were like, oh, oh shoot, gosh. we're still live. And they were like, <laughs> oh, boy. I think he actually said it out the whole thing though. So that was even worse, so especially back then. <laughs> So oh, uh, man. you don't do that oh, kind Lord, of stuff. I think Lord Charles might have been the name of the uh, dummy I was trying Lord to think Lord Charles. Of. No, Charlie McCarthy. It was Charlie McCarthy. Oh, he left the cake out in the rain, right? <laughs> I guess. Uh, That's who you need, man, with the top hat and the monocle. I will say this. You ever see that You ever see that flick Devil Doll? That's a, a that's a MST3K joint that they did. Hilarious, where a little doll gets walking up. He sounds like Hervé Villachez. Oh, man, I have seen all the... Uh, uh, I've, uh, Devil Doll is that? Oh man, is that the one that was like part of a trilogy for terror? And the lady was alone in the home with the voodoo doll. Uh, no, I think that's a different one. Okay, this one's well, just anyway, like uh, I like this. This this mannequin wants to drink. Uh, this uh this doll wants to drink. He's just like I want wine. Give me wine. I'm like, what in the world? Man, I've seen every episode uh, featuring Slappy of Goosebumps, but that's about it. Oh, love some Slappy boy. All right, let's close up the old H and P mailbag, shall we? <laughs> Hey, it worked that time. Yeah. Bale's here. And, of course, we uh, always like to read your emails, man. Uh, Go ahead and do that at uh, herearmoviepodcast at gmail.com. But, Bruce, a little bit more housekeeping. Sorry we got to keep you, uh, you know, on the hook here, folks. But we do want to thank the people that go over to the iTunes. Drop us a five-star review, a.k.a. Humdinger. Um, nigga. And it's been a while, so that's why we have to do it. Uh, this one comes to us from Monica Woe. I like that. 
Yeah. It's entitled Fantastic Podcast. One of my favorite podcasts. I found this through Preacher Podcast, which led me to Heroes and Villains. Both of these are also fantastic, which also which led me to this. Bruce's comic knowledge is impressive, and Sean Stallone connection makes me laugh every time. I particularly enjoy listening to the episodes about some uh, subpar movies. The Shadow, for example. I'd forgotten all about <laughs> Knifey. Yeah, Knifey. Uh, thanks, guys, for making my long daily commutes more entertaining. Looking forward to many more episodes. Monica, Monica, thank you for that five-star review, and we'd like to thank everybody that takes time out of their precious day to go on down to Patreon, Patreon.com. This is a, that's part of the show's over, Portress. iTunes. iTunes, that's what it's called. I'm like, what's it called? What's the thing where you do the podcast stuff again? iTunes. It's been one of those days, everybody. Uh, let's let's let me get my uh, my grounding here and uh, listen to the uh, trailer here for the tick. Hello, world. This is an epic tale, rife with destiny, adventure, blood loss, and good against evil. Well, look at you. Impossible. You're a superhero. Good eye. I am the Tick. Well, the truth. What do you bench? <laughs> no idea. Can you fly? Tick! Good grief. Destiny's on the line, Arthur. Accept the charges. Is this going to be a long call? Could I sit? Sure. How can I put this? Murder. It's just not cool. Impolite! Quite a kick. What the world needs now is us. Sweet us. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is the good stuff. I'm breaking a little bit. Taser time! <laughs> Tickle. Two bullets point blank and high voltage plus a three-story drop and look at you. <gasps> You're as alive as a daisy. Hey, Amazon, uh, don't use that music. That's just terrible. <laughs> I was sitting here dancing to it. I'm not surprised, yo, dad. <laughs> Here's the IMDb. Oh, and by the way, but before we go into IMDb, I just wanted to say Candace Bergen. Candace Bergen. What about? Her father, her father was a ventriloquist. And he's the one who used that ventriloquist dummy with the top hat and the monocle. I'm done with ventriloquism now. <laughs> Don't you tease us like that. You know you're not. Uh, uh, here's the IMDb plot line. In a world where superheroes have been real for decades, an accountant with no superpowers comes to realize his city is owned by a supervillain. As he struggles to uncover this conspiracy, he falls in league with a strange blue superhero. This is starring Peter Serafinowicz, uh, Griffin Newman, Valerie Curry, Scott uh, Spinbesser, Spinbesser, I can't pronounce that guy's name, and Jackie Nailed Earl it. Haley. Nailed it. Uh, like we said, uh, we, we kind of watched the first episode when that came out as a pilot and everything. We had some interesting thoughts on it. Uh, Bruce has not only covered the, uh, the tick once here, but also in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the, what do you call it there? The live action Fox show from back in the day. So yep. let's see what, uh, hold on. I've got it. I've got it. <laughs> it's here it is. Bruce's comic book connection. Darn near forgot it. <laughs> what do you got for us this time? Oh, this is a week. If you'd forgotten it, I would have forgotten it, too, because I kind of forgot it. Well, I've talked about The Tick twice already, as you've said, and I've covered about all there really is to cover when it comes to the bl the big blue yonder. Uh, but I'd like to talk about the little guy that makes the tick tick, as in tick like a watch, not, you know, uh, any other kind of tick. But anyone who knows anything about uh, hemovoric arachnids know that ticks are parasites. They cannot survive without drawing blood from another creature's life force. And in the case of the tick, that source of yummy red goodness is Arthur. Arthur is the tick's sidekick. 
but you may be surprised to hear that he didn't appear until issue number four of the comics. Hmm. He was gainfully employed as an accountant when he bought a moth suit at an auction. One can be tempted to ask a few questions about this, like <laughs> what kind of an auction and why a moth suit? But one of the wonderful things about the Tick comics is that it doesn't waste time with petty questions of logic when there is fun to be had. This moth suit plays into Arthur's decision to dip his toe in the white waters of superhero justice. One drawback to the suit are the wide, somewhat fluffy-looking antennae that result in Arthur looking like a bunny when his wings are retracted. In the comics, other than functioning wings and a general aura of adorableness, the suit has no powers. It's not bulletproof. It doesn't have an onboard computer, and it really amounts to little more than footy pajamas that can glide. Also, and you may be surprised to learn this, but going around town in a bunny moth suit is criteria that can get an accountant lifetime psychiatric leave. Now, given the theme of Arthur's suit, one can assume he planned to call himself the moth or maybe even the moth of justice or white wings of vengeance or something like that, but he never seems to have made it past Arthur. After rescuing a powerful ninja artifact called the Thorn of Oblivion and helping the Tick and Oedipus defeat the ninjas, Arthur decides to formally become the Tick's sidekick. He is an extremely kind, sensible, and intelligent person, but his social skills are somewhat lacking as he is shy and he lacks self-confidence. Arthur often shows mild discomfort or annoyance with the dangers and frustrations of being a superhero sidekick. Various family members and friends continuously beg him to give up his superhero lifestyle. He has been animated and portrayed by not one, but two different live action actors. His famous battle cry is not in the face. And he's one of the few superheroes to wear regular old spectacles while fighting crime. Everything in the ticks world is fluid with only two things being constant. One is of course the tick, but the other is his partner in non-crime Arthur. Yeah. So with this second episode, they had some, they had a little bit of a period in between the pilot episode that we watched and reviewed back on episode. I don't know what, cause I didn't look it up. Uh, <laughs> go, go scroll. You'll find some other things that you like. I promise. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we, we talked about it then and we we had some problems, especially with the suit. I think the suit was one of our biggest things of like, what is this weird monstrosity that they've got strapped over to, uh, uh Peter Serafinowicz and guess what? They changed it, and I love the way they covered it too. They changed it for the better, and then um, they played it off in a, a you know, it's not the first uh, television show to ever do this, but Arthur says, you know, something looks different about the suit, and then he just like brushes it off and they go about their business. A good old fashioned, never you mind. Yeah, like the first time Sarah Chalky showed up on, uh, uh, not the first time Sarah Chalky showed up, but the first time the original Becky showed up after Sarah Chalky's uh, period on Roseanne, and then. Uh, she walks into the room and her sister says, well, what are you what are you looking at? She goes, I don't know. I just feel like I haven't seen you in over a year or something like that. You know, yeah, they do that in shows. Yeah, there's there's been a couple of those where it's just like, huh, I barely it, recognize you anymore. <laughs> but having all that time between the pilot and episode two really made that abrupt change not the least bit jarring. You know what I mean? Because I didn't have it like I didn't rewatch the pilot. I jumped I straight either. into episode two. And I just uh, like the suit melded my memory so that like my retrograde memory just put that suit on the tick in the pilot. Then I went back and saw some clips from the pilot after I'd finished watching uh, these six episodes. And I thought, wow, they really did make an improvement on that. Such suit. a better improvement on it. And the more I, the more I watch it, the more I kind of, because one of the things uh, when, when we had the Patrick Warburton version is you just, you see his face fully in there. Now, other than that, I mean, I do like that outfit a whole bunch and I think it kind of makes the most sense because it's, you know, smooth and just easy like the comic is right yeah uh but with this one it, you still have the kind of junky stuff in there but i will say this i do i've grown accustomed and i actually like the eye cutouts which is obviously more like the, the book but i like those more than i do because for the for the longest time i was just like oh just had the face cut out just like the fox version well i know i think this one's actually better yeah, I like the eye cutouts, and I like the way they changed them from the pilot. You know, that was one of the things I didn't like a lot about the pilot. But they made them like bigger, so, so they're the, bigger the in circles this one. Okay. are rounder. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe maybe that's why I was face. maybe that's why I was digging it more because I mean I because I, I didn't I haven't done the I didn't do the A B because I figured it would just throw me out too much. Uh, yeah. 
but yeah, if they made him bigger, then yeah. Which now, now I'm th- kind of thinking about it, it does make more sense that that's what they did, and it looks so much better. It really works this time. Yeah, it worked a lot for me, man. I, I was very uh, happy with how they updated the suit. I'm also happy with the change in tone. Yeah, um, I was going to ask the, you do you do you think that it changed to a much more comedic tone and yes. and it felt more like the Tick, right? Yeah, there's a couple things I'll say about the change in tone uh, compared to the tick that we got in the pilot and the tick we got in episode two. I feel like, uh, and boy, you're going to have to say the actor's last name for him. Is it Serafa Watts? Sarah Finowitz. Yeah, that's what I said. Sarah Finnegan. Um, (laughs) Anyway, uh, the actor, man, I think he embraced some of the the good parts of Warburton's performance in Mm -hmm. between the pilot and the second episode. And he also borrowed just a little bit from the dearly departed adam west in that uh first couple of episodes right which which also like when you kind of look at back at some of the stuff you can see how it there's a, a bit of that pro- possible influence in there and stuff as well i can't tell you what's inside of ben edlin's head but uh it, it feels like there's a little bit of that in there you know oh yeah yeah um and uh i don't know the villains were lightened up a little bit it lost uh some of that Man, it really felt to me like, okay, they're trying to give us something that would fit in Nolan's uh, Dark Knight universe or in some of the early Marvel Cinematic Universe, and that's all pretty much gone here. They're just giving us the tick. Yeah, it was like, like I felt the entire time watching these episodes, man, I just had a smile on my face because it feels like they brought back what this thing was supposed to be. And they also nipped something in the bud in the third episode, you know, the second of those that we watched, but episode three of the, mm-hmm. the season here. Um, that I was starting to worry. I, I didn't want it to happen. It's something that I really felt like was going to happen after the pilot. But this whole idea of is Arthur a reliable narrator? Like, is if the tick is literally just a figment mm-hmm. of his imagination, yeah. it's not going to work for me. And I really thought they were going to play with us that way. But you know, in episode three, his uh, he's convinced himself that the tick's just a figment of his imagination nation then his sister can see him and i'm i exhale in relief that we're not going to have to deal with that for the whole season about is he real or is he imaginary i didn't want to see something like what we got from mtv's the max right or in or if, you know like he's just ducking out in just the nick of time and stuff because they do show some things back and forth where like he goes back in his memory and just goes yeah he just kind of disappeared on me and everything and it's like wait a second no that i am nuts and it's like no no you're not nuts sorry i, I didn't want them to sixth census on this show like in the, yeah. the season finale, we find out he was dead the whole time or something. So I'm glad they did away You've with that. You've been real in quickly. an insane asylum. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really, uh, what was that Leonardo? Oh, I don't want to ruin, spoil too many weird non-related yeah. movies, but you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know, man. I, uh, uh, I think that when they filmed the pilot, Edlin may have been questioning whether or not he wanted to go that route and then decided, no, let's just give people what they want. Yeah, I mean, like, look, here's the thing, man. I, I liken it to, you know, and, and as we've kind of stated on the uh, program before and everything, Edlin had, like, a lot of uh, success as a young guy, you know? And yep. it, it happens to, like, a lot of bands and stuff. Now, they just put it out. Uh, go listen to uh, the, the Rolling Stones just dropped a live version of Sticky Fingers, right? And so while the Stones have never been, I, I look, I'm a big Stones fan, but they're not the greatest live band. But, like, music-wise, they're good, but Jagger just does not do well live. Um, but when listening back to that album and everything, you know, Sticky Fingers is something that, you, you know, everybody's listened to a million times. Uh, when you hear it live and everything, these guys have been doing this album for 40 years, you know? Yeah. So it's yeah. it's going to be, they always have to do it a little bit different. There's going to be some different stuff in there. And it's like, you, you, you're you you either going to dig it or you're not going to dig it. Uh, and then you'll just go, well, I'm just going to go back to the studio album. It was 40 years ago and it worked really, it was perfect then. Why, why try to improve on something that's perfect? And I, I think, uh, you know, anybody that has this kind of success young, especially, goes through a thing of like, hey, I've been sitting in this, you know, tick pool, if you will, for so long, my fingers starting to prune up, I need to do a little something else. Let's try to, let's, let's vary things up a little bit. But at the same time, too, you can come across the problem of, hey, man, this isn't really being true to what you put to us the first time. And it's not what we really fell in love with. And there does come a time when, you know, and, and I think Marvel does a fantastic job with it, is giving us something that we know and that we love, but changing it just enough so it's fun and different and new while still being that same lovely comfort food, you know? Exactly, man. And I think that's something that Edlin keyed in a little bit between episode one and episode two. And, you know, as far as sort of... um 
I don't know, art, uh, artists coming to loathe their own greatest creation. Like, you know, the famous story, the, the, the writer who wrote the Winnie the Pooh stories hated that story because it made him so much money and all the like legitimate adult uh, themed literary stories he wrote nobody would ever buy. Um, well, with Ben Edlin, he gets to avoid that with The Tick because he's had a lot of success in the world of television and movies. You know, he's currently the showrunner for Gotham where he can get a whole different side of his creative uh, juices flowing than he does with The Tick. So I, I think that helps too. I think it would be rough if he hadn't done anything but The Tick from the time That's of the 17th. That's very true. By the way, you seen that trailer for the for the uh, Winnie the Pooh movie with the with uh, what's-his-face in it? No, I haven't. It's, it's a Johnny li- Depp. No, no, no. It's 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 a live action, uh, uh, just telling of the author's life and everything with uh, oh. Dom now Gleason in it. And, oh, I think I'll like that. Oh my gosh, I was crying during the trailer, going, "Oh god, oh, god. <laughs> this is gonna be uh, Adam's gonna be a bottle of goo on that one, boy." Uh, but yeah, it's if you if you kind of wallowed in that stuff for so long, man, you can just go like, "I just want to do something different," and then somebody just goes. Uh, play play uh you know hotel california and they're like ah crap <laughs> well Fine. also something else that i think helps out with ed linden with this property uh kind of like i said the ticks uh world is fluid as long as you've got the tick and arthur there mm-hmm. you can change pretty much anything else you want and folks are going to roll with it so he brings in mostly all new villains all new supporting characters you know he's not really uh stuck to anything he did in the previous live action or the previous animation or the comic books he's getting to to you know, tell whole new stories, which has got to be kind of nice too. Right, right. And one of the things that I really like about this is uh, is just the oh so dry humor throughout all of it. And there's a yeah, couple so, of over the top that was missing stuff. in the pilot. There, yeah. yeah, there's a couple of over the top things, but there's so much of it that is just so just bone dry that it's just it's so great hearing like you know a boat talk talk crap back to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and Alec, Alan Tudyk is the voice of that boat, which I think is a nice touch, man. You get you get somebody that uh, folks who like the tick are going to love the idea of Alan Tudyk and get him to do voiceover, man. I think that was a nice touch. It, it's so good. It's a it's a lot of again, it's a lot of fun, and it makes a great contrast to the other. You know, I, I guess he's not an antihero. I, I I guess we could say. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, he's he's a punisher. An antihero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's the Punisher dressed like Deathstroke. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what he is. But, um, uh, you know, the, he, he does do a couple things. Uh, the, Miss Lint, this new villainess mm-hmm. that he introduces. Um, you know, you can't bring in Chippendale chair face in a show like this. I mean, you're not going to have a guy with a chair for a head. But Miss Lint, to me, man, I found so much, like, entertaining just about the concept of the character. The idea that because of her electrical charge, she keeps attracting lint and can't wear black, started out calling herself the Swiffer. I really like her. And for a show that is dealing with kind of, um, you know, speculative superhero kind of fiction, I think we get good acting performances here. And they're not asked to do the kind of acting that wins Oscars, but what they're asked to do, I think, is hard just the same. And I think they really kill it. Like that actor playing Arthur, mm-hmm. um, it looks like a simple kind of stock character or whatever. But, you know, I, I challenge anybody to try and and pretend to be Arthur and do a decent job of it. You're going to find it's hard. I, I think everybody's doing a great job here. Yeah, the actress talking about uh, Yara Martinez. She's fantastic. I thought she was a great addition into uh, into this kind of second second half, if you will, if we're if we're counting the the pilot as the first half, the new the yeah. new tick, if you will. <laughs> and, and and the guy that plays her ex husband that's still living with her in the uh, condo, he looked familiar to me. I know I've seen him somewhere else before, and he's a lot of fun. Just the whole idea that Miss Lint would have ever been married to that guy is is hilarious to me. You know, it's under the under the the top level kind of humor there. And I I think you could be I, I could be wrong and I don't remember because I've seen a lot of things in this past week. So if I get this messed up, I'm sorry. But I feel like and I feel like when we saw him for the first time in that in like that big apartment and everything, first of all, that place is pretty nice. Uh so I can understand her wanting to, him to be on. Uh but is he not listening to like 311 or something? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, he's listening to the um uh, uh come artists you got to come original all artists got to come original. That song is what I, he's listening to. I don't know to. what that is, but uh That's it though. It's 311 but, or 411. Yeah. It's got yeah. an 11 so, and it's so, got another number. So it's 311 so you know he's a D-bag. <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, I'm he, sorry. He, 311 he, fans, he, you can write me at here movie podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> I don't think you could explain away your love for 311. 
It has a $2,600 bicycle and a t-shirt that just says kombucha on it. <laughs> I know people like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that guy's great, man. Just the hilarity of him being married to Miss Lint. I uh, love the character. Also with Miss Lint, man, something that most people probably don't appreciate, but it was the first time, and, and you know, I haven't seen everything that's ever been made, but out of the stuff I've seen, it's the first time that they actually portrayed an ocular prosthesis accurately. That, I was gonna ask you about that. So Miss Lint's got got a got a fake eye of some sort here, and uh, she's got a whole she's got an armory of eyes. <laughs> yeah, man, they're all custom painted. She apparently had a lot of money spent with an ocularist, but a lot of uh, television shows and movies, um, their understanding of a glass eye, like when it pops out, you see a whole sphere. It's like just it's a little marble. Just, <laughs> yeah, but it, but in reality, the the spherical part is underneath the skin. It's sutured into the muscle. Uh, it's got connective tissue closed over it, so it's just like a shell. It almost looks like a really, really thick white porcelain contact lens that yeah. goes on that ball that's sutured in, and that's what she has. And then when she pops it in her mouth to kind of get it moist before she puts it in, I don't want to turn anybody's mm -hmm. stomach, but that is something that really happens in the real world. Like I almost wondered, like, does Ben Edlin have an uncle with a glass eye or something? How accurate everything's portrayed with that prosthesis. Well, that's the thing, man. Like, honestly, it's just I you're, you're right. That felt like it felt so specific that it had to be so like I'm I'm like, I don't know that this is a thing, but it feels specific enough to where I would not be shocked if that was a thing. Yeah, I, I, I uh, know a guy, I don't want to say any kind of identifying information, but Richard. I know a guy that has a prosthesis that has like a, um, uh, like an Irish cross painted on it or something instead of an eye. So there are people that have those custom painted prostheses. Listen, uh, you know, uh, come on, people. <laughs> first of all, it's weird enough for everybody to have to look at it in the first place. You got to sit there and put, the, put in, you know, you know, John 316 up in your eyeballs. So we all have to go, what is that? Is that the... <laughs> It was more, you know, like the land of Aaron of the whatever. NFL, you do not bro broadcast. Wait a minute. What is that? <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Um, but, but I like Miss Lint. The Pharaoh, you know, Ramses or whatever from the Pyramid Gang. I thought that was kind of funny because, you know, from the get-go, he's just a poser talking about the eye tattoo. Meanwhile, she's already got a big scar across her face and a prosthesis. I can understand why she didn't want to add to the disfigurement around that particular eye socket. It's just like, look, I've already got enough bad stuff going on here. Why do you have to kill me here? And, and you know, when, when they're talking about creative endeavors, they say you've got to kill your darlings. And sometimes people misunderstand that. But uh, what it kind of means is when something clever is in there just for the sake of being clever and doesn't add to the story, you're supposed to cut that out and make it lean. But one of those weird, like, uh, random doesn't mean anything just weird for weird sake is the fact that we see uh, Arthur's sister is part of a roller derby team and that doesn't matter at all like <laughs> like that that really contributes nothing Yet. to the story other than it just lets us know that she is and I love that kind of weird stuff just out of nowhere yet we don't know there's you, mm. <laughs> we still got more episodes in this season it could be a big roller derby finale let's hope so I don't know why like Maybe it's just chicks busting each other in the face or something, but roller derby's kind of hot, right? Oh, everybody thinks that, man. Yeah. Nobody nobody dislikes roller derby of either gender. Yeah. All right. I just want to make sure I wasn't the only one just going like, "Oh, what what are you what are you creepy and weird?" <laughs> I mean, I am, but not for that reason. <laughs> but man, uh, uh and also not only <laughs> she's in medical school, she is part of a roller derby team. She also has a job as a, as an EMT and somehow this guy uh, gets her looped into stitching up criminals. I, I love it, man. They, she has far and away the most complicated life of anyone in existence. She's on call for the mob. She's listen. This girl's got like the <laughs> the life of Bruce Leslie over here. She's got fifteen <laughs> different jobs trying to figure out what the heck's going on here. She's like, oh yeah, man, I also stitch up, uh, you know, uh, mafiosos hey, on the side. <laughs> in all fairness, I had to give up roller derby while I was in medical school. <laughs> I want to see you in those hot pants, just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, around there. I got unwigged. I got unwigged during a match and disqualified. What what gave it away? The beard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Um the terror. We get some Jack Earl Haley. And I don't think I need to say uh, anything else about the fact that we got Jack Earl Haley for people to know that I'm happy with that. Yeah, I I love how we make a because it's so different than what we're used to seeing for so many things is that Jackie Earl Haley is a little man. He's he's very small in stature and yeah. uh to have him be the big bad in this thing 
And I love that we've like really over, like just super make up him up and everything, throwing these wild contacts and all this kind of jazz. And he's just talking in a really just kind of low gravelly voice and everything. It's so silly and so over the top, but yet works so well. And uh, the terror is from the comics. He's one of the few characters here other than Arthur and the Tick that are uh, in the comics. And his defining characteristic in the comics is just that he's really, really old. And I think Jackie O'Haley definitely plays the terror as being really, really old. And I love the teeth, too, man. They, they're building so much. Uh, this whole town puts so much faith in the fact that they found his teeth. Therefore, he must be dead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're very much just <laughs> like, but we found teeth. You're like, yeah. Yeah, I, I got no. I got more teeth. And I, I like it too that his way of explaining is, I've always been good with pliers. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. Oh man, and and uh, uh, Overkill shows up, I guess, around episode three. Um, you know, as as big a part of the season as he ends up being, I was kind of surprised he didn't show up a uh, little bit earlier. But I doubt that they had him in mind when they made the pilot. I think if they knew where this was going, they could have dropped him in in the pilot, and that would have uh, maybe served to get people more excited about episode two, you know? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it comes to it a little bit later, but I, I, it doesn't feel bad because I do like how he's kind of always following him around there and looking just to uh, kill the tick. But at the same time, too, you also just want to go, take the shot, man. <laughs> There's so many yeah, times well, where he's got somebody up in the crosshairs, and it's like, pull the trigger. Pull it. Just, just pull it right now. Pull it. Pull it and you'll murder him. Pull it and you... All right. Well, I guess he's out the door now and you can't go get him. You know what you should have done? Uh, pull the trigger. You're a <laughs> horrible I like, assassin. I like this character, man. Like we said, he's a little bit Deathstroke, a little bit Punisher. Um, and I think he's a lot of fun. I like the actor that plays him. It, it almost feels at times, uh, especially some of the things he says in his first, uh, like the first episode where he gets to talk and stuff. I almost feel like maybe Edlin's taking a little bit of a dig at season one of Arrow, too, with the way that this character's portrayed. <laughs> a little bit kind of like, just... <laughs> Yeah, the city's felled me, you know, stuff like that. It's yeah, it's, it's it's all just kind of like, oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and I do just like it, too, that it. Uh, it takes you a while to realize that his character's name is Overkill. You know, because they're watching the video and going, whoo, that's Overkill. <laughs> and you think they're talking about him stabbing everybody. And I love the the tick's reaction when he sees all the dead bodies and Arthur covered with blood, and he just assumed that Arthur <laughs> slaughtered everyone, and they have to have the talk. Uh, it's just the the relationship between the two of them has really stepped up, and again, it feels like it's supposed to feel like, and I it's just above and beyond everything with that with this first with the uh, the pilot episode. It shows shows you why you need pilots, though, for real. Yeah, yeah, and and a pilot with time to uh, have public feedback, like a beta phase, if you will. Yeah. Because, you know, every show gets a pilot, and some execs watch it, and they'll probably do, you know, you screen test, you don't really get the real feedback like you do if you go wide. You know what I mean? Uh, focus group it to death. It, it seems to never really have the same result as just showing it, making it available and getting the feedback. But uh, most pilots, they they film a whole season once they pick up the pilot before anybody really gets to see the pilot and weigh in on it. So I like how Amazon did this. Or 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 they get really, really brave and just go like, well, we're ordering the whole thing to series. Just do it. I mean, you may just throw an entire season worth of television down the toilet, yeah. eh, but we got enough faith in you. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, when the tick shows up at the, the barbecue, the birthday party for Arthur's mm -hmm. stepdad, I got to tell you, man, Arthur doesn't like his stepdad. We, it, he makes it very clear that he's resentful towards uh, the stepdad. But I think he's one of the I think he'd be a cool stepdad. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it, nobody necessarily wants to have a stepdad. But if you got to have one, I think I'd like hanging out with this guy. He <laughs> likes cheese. He, he loves cheese and always wants to know about your feet. And he just seems like a gentle, easygoing, soft-spoken, you know, he's a, a, I don't know, he's probably 60-something, right? I mean, he's an older fellow. I think they said it's yeah. his 60th birthday, didn't they? Yeah. The big 6-0, -oh, and he's uh, this Asian uh, gentleman who just looks like he enjoys life, man. I, I think it'd be, you could you could definitely have a worse stepdad than this guy. Yeah, I mean, and, and of course, come on, he was, he was, he was Shredder in uh, the second Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movie. <laughs> oh, you're right, man. I knew I recognized him from somewhere. Like, he, honest to goodness, he is one of those character actors that has been on everything. He's got like 119 credits to his name. He's been on everything from like MacGyver to Bones to, you know, the Hawaii Five-0, 
Uh, you, you name it, that cat's been on it, dude. Oh, and he's just mesmerized with the tick. You know, he can't get enough of the tick. Like, he loves the guy. Instead of thinking he's crazy and weird and being uncomfortable with him around, he just embraces him. <laughs> I love it when he asks him, you know, is, is that a costume or is that just you? <laughs> he's like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Am I never nude or am I never not nude? <laughs> Again, that's again that's that stuff that I don't know that would have been in that pilot. And that would have yeah. been if that pilot would have went on, I don't think weird little conversations like this would have happened. Uh because I think part of it, and you you correct me if you think I'm wrong here, uh, but I think they also may just kind of have felt when they were doing the pilot, well, we don't want to be too much like the Fox show. You know? And then I think a lot of what they heard was, oh, we wanted the Fox show instead yeah, of this. It's like, so, just give me, give me, give me what I want. You know, I'll tell you that I want something different, but what I really want is the same thing, but different. Don't give me what I say I want. Give me what I really want. Yeah, exactly. No, that's your, no, that is 110% true. Cause everybody, uh, everybody forever just goes like, you know what, man, we don't need this. Uh, we don't, we don't want the transformers being, you know, we don't want these humans in there. We just want the transformers. I promise you, if you just had an all transformers movie and there were no human characters, everyone in that theater would fall asleep. Yep, Cause it's boring. Man. You're right. You're right. It would be tough to follow along. You got to have some, even the cartoon had uh, the little, the little guy, the, the human kid that ran around with them. Yeah. So it's not like, trust me, you, you'd get bored of that stuff quick, but you're right. It's Spike, what we, his name was Spike. I had to think about it. What we, what we think we want or what, what we actually want instead of exactly what we think we want. We think we want something else different, but nah, not really. <laughs> it's like if I ask my kid, what do you want for breakfast? You know, I want some uh, Hershey bars with some chocolate syrup on it and uh, some sprinkles. You shut but up. You were is. having a nutritious meal here. This is cookie crisp. <laughs> Knock it out. <laughs> exactly. You got to put a little something to temper it or you won't be able to finish it. <laughs> but I also like it, you know, the tick shows up and, and, you know, that episode of the tick that we talked about was uh, a few years back. So they dealt with um, uh, they dealt with alternative. Uh, I don't want to use the word alternative. They dealt with gay relationships differently on television back then and mm -hmm. had to use it as a bit more of a heavy handed metaphor in the original tick live action. But I like it here when the tick walks in and says, I'm his partner and everybody like says, Oh, well, we're so happy for him. Like they're, they're still playing that game, but from a different point of view, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and, and, then, and of course, if this is the guy who shows up though, that's, that's just weird for anybody, but I, I God bless these people <laughs> for just like, that's not the reason that they should be saying, Ooh, this is weird. It should be like, this man is in a giant blue outfit here. That's you. Should, your antenna, no pun intended, should be going up on this one going, Oh, is, is he, is he a crazy person? Uh, this proves there is a lid for every pot because you got to have an idea that Arthur hasn't had much like uh, much luck in the dating world anyway. <laughs> so they're they're definitely shocked when uh, Miss Lynch shows up claiming to be Pal Paloma. Is that what she says her name is? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> and she is also <laughs> interested in dating Arthur as her cover story. So it's a lot of fun here at the family cookout, and they go upstairs and. He, he she forces him to put on the uh, uh, the the flight suit again, and we get a little bit of shenanigans there with a vacuum cleaner and the lint exploding and <laughs> shaming her into running off. And he Arthur flies out the window. I, I like how I, I like the suit. Like I said, it's it's not part of the actual you know mythos and everything, but I like this suit. I like that it's kind of uh, it's it's given this a bit of agency at the same time too. And in the world yeah. of like, uh, you know, of Iron Man and everything, people are used to seeing that stuff now because you and know, I, back I love in the, the day, idea they that it's ridiculously high tech, but still um, they couldn't come up with something better than looking like an actual moth. And, you know, you see the guy in flight. And you're not believing for a minute that this has any uh, possibility of being a real thing in the real world, that those wings could carry a man through the air. <laughs> I, I like how I love the fact that it has autopilot, and if you just it disengage <laughs> autopilot, you go, you sink to the ground like a stone. I would like it if, when it was on autopilot, it just flew to a street light and hovered. <laughs> Ooh! Oh, look at this! <laughs> how about that? Oh, green! And, all, and you know, it has like the goggles that come over his eyes that he can engage when he's using the suit. Uh, the retractable goggles. I think those are nice. But I would like it if when the goggles came down, he still like put his glasses on over top of the goggles or something. Because the whole time I'm wondering, where did he put his glasses? Because when he takes the helmet off, he all automatically has them back on. We never really see him put the glasses on or take them off. I, I, I like stupid stuff like that where it's just like this doesn't make any sense. Where, uh, you know, like, like we see in all the Batman films and stuff, you know, 
whoever's playing Batman's got a lot of black eye makeup underneath that. They rip off the mask. Ain't no eye makeup underneath there. It's just like, what kind of horse hockey is this, boy? But, but I like the ridiculous stuff, too. Like in Batman 66, when, Arth, uh, when uh, uh, boy, I almost called Alfred Ar- Arthur because I'm talking about the tech. But when Alfred puts on a mask to try to disguise his identity, he still puts on those glasses on the outside of the mask. <laughs> like, I love that. And I wish that Arthur did that. I thought you were going to be, I thought you were going to talk about like Arthur, uh, like, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, when Arthur was really, really drunk and put on that Batman costume. <laughs> that would be a great, uh, that was in Arthur too. Like hey, on everybody, I'm, I'm Batman or something. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Dudley Moore's best superhero performance. <laughs> Dudley Moore is Batman. <laughs> oh man. But, uh, the tick, uh, the tick and overkill have their little fight and, and the ticks fights are always fun because he has absolutely no reason to be afraid of fighting. And then overkill finds his weakness or his sensitive antennae. I love that part. I, I love that. Where he's just like, no, no, no. Who says <laughs> Don't touch it. Who's, it's not like it even hurts. It's just like, uh, it's uncomfortable, you know, like, like he might as well put his finger in his belly button or something. Bullets just bounce right off. He can fall down an entire, you know, 10 stories, not a scratch on him, but d- touch them in 10. It's like, Oh no, stop. <laughs> I think it'd be funny if there's an episode like where his antenna get broken and then he's deaf until they get fixed. <laughs> well, no, he has ear holes. That's another weird thing. So you yeah, know. But it would be something weird, man. The antenna get broken and all of a sudden he can't smell or something. There like you that. go. Some That's probably more happens. accurate. <laughs> the lady making the rice, man, too. Just how much joy he gets from the name of that rice dish that uh, Oma makes. <laughs> she goes through this thing. Oh, that's fantastic. We're gonna call it rice. <laughs> <laughs> This is so bad. And I love how that's kind of become their de facto lair is a convenience store. I do like that, man. That's always a nice touch with the tick. Like the original live action always hanging out in Arthur's apartment here. The uh, uh, the the bodega, I guess you would call that. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. And Arthur steals a poncho from uh, the, the bodega that's actually in his building. Like, if you're going to shoplift, at least do it, like, at a store you don't frequent on the regular. Yeah, man, they'll they'll kind of recognize you when you come in. But I will say, this guy, while a little high strung, is also at the same time a little bit too cool with some stuff. <laughs> you're right, man. A lot of people are like that in here. He's just like, he's very upset, but at the same time, also a little bit more forgiving than one would imagine. And, giving and his we temperament. Keep, we keep getting these glimpses of Superion that make me think in the back half of this season, something's going to have to happen with Superion. And they're also giving us the big naked guy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, throughout the entire thing. And, and I love it because uh, I can't speak for episode one, but I mean, even throughout with all out episode two and on and on and on, they're always kind of dropping some stuff in the background about, Hey, here's what's going on. There's always a news story. That's just a little bit aloof in the background somewhere. Somebody's watching TV or, you know, you hear something on the radio and, and we finally see it and we really don't know a lot about it, but it's just a big giant naked man. Yeah. They give us the background of, uh, uh, what was the cat guy's name? I've already forgotten now, but like Katmandu, that was it. The mm-hmm. guy Katmandu, we see him in the background and they explain the 28th Amendment that means uh, superheroes don't have to give up their identity to the cops. Uh, we get a little bit of background on like a fisherman catches uh, uh, the the Aquaman equivalent in this world in one of his tuna nets or something like that. Like there's little stuff. They really cram a lot into these episodes that are all sub 30 minutes. Yeah, and I will say that that's I think that is actually really one of the highlights of this program is that it's 30 that each is well 27 minutes long. Uh, no commercials obviously, but it goes through at a nice brisk pace. You hit the end of an episode and you're like, "Oh shoot, I want to watch the next one." You don't have that kind of like I think if it, if each episode were an hour, you may just kind of go like Okay, I'm done with that for a little bit, but let's, you know, I'll see you next time. But with this, you finish to like one an and you're Andes like, oh, Mint. Yeah. You know, like an Andes Mint. You throw one of those in your mouth and you're like, oh, that was refreshing. That was nice. I could go for another. But if somebody gave you an Andes Mint that was like the size of a dictionary, that would just be a bit much. Yes, the size. An a- All right. <laughs> Who, what? <laughs> this is, uh, I mean, you know, hair movie podcast at gmail.com. Just share your thoughts. I, I don't care. <laughs> Andy's mint the size of a dictionary. You know, that's well. Somebody, somebody knows what he's getting for Christmas now. So I mean, I guess that's over. <laughs> oh man, I got one of those big Hershey kisses one time. They're hard to eat. <laughs> Get Daddy his fork and knife. We're having Hershey kiss for dinner again. 
it was almost bedtime by the time I got through the second one. You get over here. I got to carve this. <laughs> He's got the little electric. <laughs> it's like Thanksgiving turkey. It's the Thanksgiving Hershey's Come kiss. here and get yourself a slice of Hershey's kiss, kids. <laughs> <laughs> This is the best Thanksgiving ever, isn't it? <laughs> oh, next year we're getting the world's largest M&M. and <laughs> Oh, don't get the peanut M&M that big. That's I don't know where that peanut's coming from. <laughs> but yeah, man. Uh, so I mean, I don't know what else too much more to say. But it, it's this show is a lot of fun. I, I like everything that's going in it. It feels like it's a little. It, it feels like they listened to what people were saying. And or just decided, you know what, we're just going to do what we're going to do and forget about it, you know? Yeah. And uh, there's not a single performance that falls flat for me, even like the the background henchmen and stuff. I think I think it's just it's solid, man. Yeah, everybody's a lot of fun and the, and the show becomes what it's supposed to be fun. And so if you watch the first episode and you were like, eh, I don't really you know, maybe it's not my bag. Take a second look. That's why we do this for you. So you know whether or not you can take a second look. And I honestly, I'm going to finish this season out. And uh, I, I actually think there's only 10 episodes total. Oh, really? I thought there were uh, going to be six more. That doesn't uh, have any more episodes till February. So I thought maybe there were six more. I, I'm just guessing, though. May, I, I don't know. At least according to IMDb, when you look at all the major players, 10 episodes. Uh-huh. So Okay, well, that that's something you can usually hang your hat on. So I would I would guess it's on that, but uh, you know, looking forward to they're it. Gonna, they're gonna have two clip shows thrown in, <laughs> just by the by the yeah, end of the first <laughs> season. You're already throwing to clip shows. <laughs> yeah, love that idea. Well, it's come that time of the show, Bruce. So uh, it, there's no way, man. I mean, this this show has some good actors and stuff, but there's no way this could have a link to Sylvester Stallone. Well, I got news for you, Bruce. Thank you, and I have a prepared statement. Oh, really? I think I just hit my desk. Henry B. Miller (laughs) is an editor for an episode (laughs) of The Tick on Amazon. Now, this is my wheelhouse. I was a paid editor for years, and when you're an editor, you pay attention to every detail. Being an editor is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, except this jigsaw puzzle, there's not only over a million pieces, there are also a ton of pieces that you will never, ever use. (laughs) <laughs> You've got to figure out what goes in and what never sees the light of day. Famed Apocalypse Now editor, Academy Award winner, Walter Murch writes in his book, In the Blink of an Eye, which I have read. Yay. He writes, uh, <laughs> an editor's job should be just that, a blink of the audience's eye. Unless you're doing it on purpose for emphasis, your audience should never see the cut. The next shot should just be an extension of the last. They say a movie's made three times. Once when it's written on the page, the next when it's shot, and finally when it's edited. The editor is the gatekeeper for how good a show is, yet the highest praise you can give an editor is none. That's right. If you did your job amazingly well, no one notices. The only notice you'll get is when you failed. The editors are truly the unsung heroes of television and film. And Harry B. Miller has edited several well-known TV shows from the new Hawaii Five-0 to Dollhouse, Bones, Eureka, Dune, and, of course, an episode of this week's The Tick. But Harry B. Miller has had many hats over his career. He's also done a lot of work as a sound editor. Now, these are the guys who sync up all the sound effects, every step, every movement, the breeze in the air, the creak of the house. Harry B. Miller helped put that sound in there for flicks like Back to the Future, Days of Thunder, In the Mouth of Madness, Wayne's World 2, The Game, Alien Resurrection, Jingle All the Way, Waterworld, and of course, Rocky V. Uh, The best Rocky. (laughs) A movie that stars a man whose sweat could be used to clean an engine block or as an aphrodisiac, Sylvester Stallone. Yes, Harry B. Miller edited all of those Rocky punches to the dome of Tommy Machine Gun Morrison in that famous street brawl that told the world, okay, maybe it's time for these Rocky flicks to take a break. So thank you for your contribution to sound and editing, Harry B. Miller, and thank you, Agent Peers, for listening to another amazing Stallone connection. Now, little chum, let's rate this bad boy so we can get back to what we doing be- what we do best, fighting crime. Yes, out of all seven Rocky movies, Rocky Five is far and away the best. Yeah, oh my gosh, what a what a! It really, at the end of that, you're just like, 
okay, yeah, this should, we should stop for a while. We should not be doing any more of these. It's yeah. a wonder why, why it was, it was, oof, Rocky, my goodness. Rocky five, Rocky five was one of those rare movies that I saw for free and still asked for my money back. <laughs> give me, just get, you owe me 12 bucks. <laughs> All yeah, right. people were lining up for days to pay to not have to see it. <laughs> Here's $10. Don't let me watch this ever. <laughs> so we got to get down to it. Bruce, here on Hero Movie Podcast, we have our patented Robin rating system. Uh, if you want to check that out, go to facebook.com slash Hero Movie Podcast. That's right there at the top of the page. And while you're there, why don't you just you know drop us a like there, man? We'd really appreciate that. Bruce, uh, for the first six episodes of The Tick, what is your Robin rating, sir? Well, I can say I really liked uh, episodes two through six a lot more than I liked the pilot. And I didn't dislike the pilot. I just like two through six a lot more than the pilot. I don't know. I, I don't know what to call this. It's not quite a half season. It's a season chunk, I guess, a season lunk. All chunk of the season. season. <laughs> yeah, but but it's good, man. I'm wanting to see more. I you know, I've been on record as saying how much I loved uh, Patrick Warburton's tick. And I'm kind of feeling a little bit like I'm getting some some of the goodness of the Warburton tick, but getting a little higher production value, a little more modern filmmaking. So uh, it's good all the way around. I'm going to give it a Tim Drake and say I'm looking forward to more. Yeah, I'm kind of the same. I mean, I almost want to give it all the way up to Dick Grayson, but I want to leave a little bit of room there uh, just in case. But uh, right now it's it's very strong in the Tim Drake category. I like a lot of it, and I hope, because I don't foresee it going that way with the rest of this season. Uh, but come season two, if they do, if they decide to do that, which I hope this is, is successful. And I think, you know, H and peers go out and watch it, help make this thing successful. Uh, I hope they get into, uh, having more, uh, more superheroes in there, you know, maybe not necessarily, yeah. they, they don't necessarily have to be the ones that we know if, the, if, if they are awesome, but if not, that's cool too. I think they've always shown, uh, throughout the, you know, the regular, the animation, the comic, and the live action uh-huh. stuff that they're good at making up cool little, you know, offbeat superheroes I, and stuff. So. And I'd kind of like to see a spin off with that talking dog that they had in one of these episodes. Oh my gosh, the talking dog. We totally forgot about the dog. And he's just like, onward. He's not my he was onward and his partner was Christian Soldier. <laughs> it was so bizarre. <laughs> that dog, it's just like, and he's so serious. And the guy who's interviewing the dog is so serious. It's great. Yeah. Uh, so I, I hope to see more little silly stuff like that coming up in, uh, you know, a possible season two here i think they they went through they they listened they changed this stuff and they made this show a whole heck of a lot of fun uh so that's a pretty strong recommendations from both of us all right everybody that is it for this episode next week uh we're going to be talking about the first two or three depending upon how you want to count them episodes of uh what's it called again Oh, the Inhumans. I was just, I was like, as much of me is trying to forget this. I, kn- I know the Inhumans <laughs> well enough. I know the, all the characters and everything, but yet I'm still just like, oh, if I say it, it becomes true. <laughs> so yeah. uh, we're going to be covering that of the Inhumans there. And uh, it's, it's you know, they had their IMAX debut and maybe that was probably a bad idea because it gave everybody a couple of weeks to go by and go, oh, maybe this isn't so hot, but we'll be talking about that and see if it's worth watching, if you need to do that. So check that out next week and we'll have a little blurb from our own Sean Keenan about it. So, uh, Yay. you know, don't worry. He's going to be here in, in spirit and somewhat in voice. If not, if not live doggone it, he'll be here on tape. In the meantime, Bruce, where can we find more of your work on the internet this week? I'm always pointing people towards Amazon to uh, my latest book, Dragon in Gallus. A uh, lot of fun, man. This is uh, the second entry in what I'm hoping will be my epic fantasy uh, trilogy, The Lump Adventures. It's got a lot of fun. It's got, you know, a blind dragon. It's got ghosts. It's got sword fights. It's got stick fights. It's pretty much got a lot of fights, so that's good for it, right? All the stick fights. And it's available on Audible, so you want to slide me a credit and pick up that audiobook, I would love you for that. It's also on ebook, which is enrolled in Kindle Unlimited, so subscribers can read that for free. And the good old paperback is out there for people that like to have something to put on the shelf. You can find them all at Amazon, and uh, don't forget my other books while you're there. Check them out. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, people. You buying these books helps not only, uh, you know, put a smile on Bruce's face. It also helps him write our book faster. Bruce, with, I'm getting so close. Man. With, with your permission, I want to read a quick excerpt here that Bruce shared with us today. If Go that's ahead, cool man. with you. Go ahead. The bathroom door burst open and Sean leaped out. 
He landed in a three-point stance and stuck out one hand, palm up, with two middle with his two middle fingers pressed against his palm while the thumb, index finger, and pinky stuck out. He was dressed as Spider-Man, or more accurately, Nick Hammond's version of Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I, I'm getting so close to the end on that one that I'll go back to do a little, uh, you know, polishing on it and hopefully have that up and at them for folks uh, by the end of this month. No, by the midway of next month, I should have it. It's looked a stocking stuffer, everybody. Come on now. <laughs> Who doesn't want to stock uh, to stuff their stocking with Sean Keenan and a Nick Gaiman spider suit? Who doesn't want that? Mommy, I'll be coming home for Christmas. I don't know what that <laughs> means. It just sounded like a really great segue, didn't it? And of course, it sure did. <laughs> of course, my other podcast here, movie po- or the film find at thefilmfind.com uh, and Nerd Talk Now at nerdtalknow.com. Usually do live shows on Saturdays, but uh, we're switching stuff up a little bit this week because I've done a little bit of video editing for you. So if you want to check that out, it is also available there after the uh, uh, after the matter and everything nerdtalknow.com thank you guys so much remember uh, support us over at patreon.com slash HMP email us at heromoviepodcast at gmail.com for the absent Sean Keenan and Bruce Leslie I'm Adam Porters we'll see you next week and remember uh, what do I say at the end of this show stay you super everybody you say you gotta be one of the good guys yeah I you? did I'm telling you that's about the second stay time I've almost stay super screwed. everybody yeah <laughs> <laughs> goodbye Marty and Navy.